Hey! Don't worry about the headband. It's a school thing. I'm sorry this is going to be a lot of people's very first impression of me, so... I usually don't look like this, but I might in the future if it's less revolting than how I usually look. So NVIDIA has launched their new budget graphics card, the GeForce GT 1030. It's aimed to be a direct competitor to AMD's RX 550. It's a low power, low wattage part starting at just $70. Mine is from MSI. But I won't be comparing those two graphics cards together. Instead, I'm much more interested in how this is replacing NVIDIA's pr previous uh, $70 budget option, the GT 730. I reviewed the GT 730 almost two years ago, and it became very popular on my very small, very fresh channel. It was NVIDIA's previous $70 option, which allowed for very light gaming. Now, I'm well aware this isn't a very good option in terms of dollars per frame, nor is it even a marketed as a gaming graphics card. However, we're going to game with it anyway. It might be able to get away with some light gaming, maybe. Now, inside the box, you only get a couple things. You get the 1030 itself, you get a low profile bracket, as well as some drivers, and an installation guide. For the most part, the GT1030 will be a single slot card with the option to change it to low profile with that bracket included that I just mentioned. But there are some dual slot versions. Uh, MSI has one as far as I know uh, at the time of writing this little script, but there could be more out soon. You can even get passively cooled 1030s that uh, exclude a fan and just have an array of fins to help spread out the heat and dissipate it or whatever. Most 1030s are a single slot like I just mentioned. However, you can, like I just mentioned before, you can uh, install the low profile bracket to fit into your low profile case given you do have the space requirements, which you should. The card's only 159 millimeters, 69 millimeters, and then 19 millimeters. This thing's very small. Oh, the IO is kind of weird. I, we finally ditched uh, DVI and VGA. Now it's just DisplayPort and HDMI. I will admit, I still use DVI on my main system, and I feel like VGA is, um, it, it, it's less popular now, but I feel like it, it's still, it could still be a thing on, uh, lower-end cards where you typically would pair with a lower-end monitor, you know, that would probably still take VGA. However, uh, on Newegg, while browsing, I did notice a lot of 1030s still, they'd had, um, HDMI and DVI. This one happens to have DisplayPort 1.4. This one does have HDMI 2.0B and DisplayPort 1.4, like I just said, with a max resolution of, I think, 7680 by 4320, which is 8K at 60 hertz. And that's pretty massive for a card like this. Now, I don't know this for a fact, actually, I'm pretty certain that if you do pull 8K, you're gonna have to plug in both of these ports into a single monitor. I'm just saying, because I know that for certain 8K displays to run, you do need two DisplayPort 1.4s connected straight in there to run that uh, the full 60 hertz. Just a little thing. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I didn't read that. I'm just assuming strongly. The card is a really slick, nice black PCB, but there are like pink accents on the little capacitors as well as on the, uh, the fan cable and a bunch of like little solder points and whatnot, like silver solder points. And it just makes the card not look too pretty. However, this is a very small and compact design. It has a black heat sink, with a bunch of like little fins on it going across and a 50 millimeter fan. Other than that, I can't say much too much else about it. It's really small, compact, but it is still slightly longer than the GT 730. If I compare these together, there we go. The heat sink does uh, droop off the edge just a little bit. Now installing this card is pretty simple. First you have to decide whether you want to stick with the default already installed um, bracket or if you want to go with the low profile one. Find a PCI Express X16 physical slot on your motherboard. Unfortunately this card's only Gen 3 4X electrically. Slide it in and first make sure you do unlock the uh, little uh, latch on your motherboard if you do have that. Once it's snug you can screw it in and then plug in your desired cable or cables. Pizza time! I got myself a little pizza, sorry. A little Totino's. So in terms of specs, we're gonna be comparing this to um, NVIDIA's previous generation, GT730. You know, little comparison. So this is the older Kepler architecture. While this card uses uh, the new Pascal architecture, which makes it more efficient and very, very powerful. Both these cards share the same amount of CUDA cores, however, this one is clocked at 1006 megahertz by default, while this one has a base clock of 1265 with a boost clock of 1518 megahertz. However, in my testing, it did boost all the way without overclocking 
default fan speed and everything, it boosted all the way to 17, 1721 megahertz. Insane. They also both have two gigs of GDDR5 memory on a 64-bit memory interface. The 730s memory is clocked at 5,000 megahertz, while the 1030s memory is clocked at 6,008. They both recommend a 300 watt power supply because that's pretty minimal. You don't want to ever have a lot lower, lower than that these days. Um, but the 730 is estimated to pull 49 watts. This one at least. It's uh, the highest clocked one as far as I'm aware. And then the 1030 is only estimated to pull 30 watts, which is pretty crazy thanks to Pascal. The 730 has three ports, so it can take up three displays, and this one can only take up to two because of its two displays. Or two inputs, my bad. Oh yeah, and also these cards both support DirectX 12 and OpenGL 4.5. Over the weekend, I paid express shipping to go ahead and get a new system in uh, because I didn't want to test this hardware on a, a three generation, because oh, I didn't want to test this new hardware on a three generation old i5. No, I know, Haswell's well getting pretty old now. So I have the Ryzen 5 1600X with paired with an MSI B350M Gaming Pro motherboard, a little MATX board. I'll have a little review or overview thing of that soon. That's not gonna be my main board. I'm just gonna, I have it for now while my new board comes in and then I'll swap that out. I also have 16 gigs of G-Skill DDR4 3000 megahertz RAM. However, it is clocked at 2933 megahertz. And don't forget to subscribe if you would like to see me build my new system here in the future at some point when I get everything. So I'm only running at stock speeds and we're gonna be looking at the averages as well as 0.1% lows and 1% lows because that's what everyone's doing now. They, Everyone recently has given up on just doing minimums and stuff and this, which this makes more sense. It's just, I don't know why it took so long for everyone to figure out uh, what the hell and how the hell to do this. Oh, also everything's gonna be run at 1080p as well. Fuck. That is good. That is good pizza. Rise of the Tomb Raider ran well enough. It's hard for lower end hardware to run this game. So I have noticed since what I played while well, benchmarking didn't a lot of, didn't involve a lot of like firefights and stuff. Uh, it was, it wasn't too fast paced. I just did what you did the other 50% of the time and solve puzzles. I was surprised that Shadow of Mordor did play well enough on low settings. I did notice a little bit of stuttering while playing, but it was a playable enough experience. Battlefield 1 actually plays really well. On medium settings, you can get pretty good frame rates, and if you turn the settings down a little bit closer to low, you'll be able to get closer to 60 FPS or even exceed 60 FPS. Uh, <clears throat> Morty. Now on GTA 5, the two gigabytes of the frame buffer is a bit, you know, a bit low. You only get two gigs of GDDR5, and that is the limiting factor here. I know you can turn off the, the recommended thing. It remained very playable when I moved everything to high except for the normal tech, except I had normal textures on, and MSAA was off. When I turned that on, you dropped to 30 FPS or below. So, now CSGO runs super well. I was surprised at the minimal stuttering and really good frame rates. I, I hardly could not tell I wasn't playing on my main system. Doom runs well enough at 1080p. I tried running the game at medium settings, but while on low, the 1% 0.1% lows weren't the greatest, as well as the average frame rate. Maybe if you turn down the resolution, you get some higher texture quality up in there, but it's a great game if you don't mind the lowered graphical fidelity. Fallout 4 isn't the greatest, smoothest experience ever on here. The 0.1% lows were pretty terrible, but it is playable. Unfortunately, you are still stuck with the, the low preset. On Fire Strike, I was getting about 5 FPS the whole time and ended with a score of 3,654. That's, that's not very great. That's just the graphic score, not the overall. During the majority of these tests, the card ran at a whopping 1,721 megahertz. So it did go above a couple times, but for the most part, that's where it ran. At the clock speed, however, the temperature was about 69 to 70 degrees at 51% fan speed. However, it did remain very, very quiet compared to the GT730 just being on. This is a very quiet fan. In conclusion, the GT1030 in almost every single test scored about twice as good as the previous generation GT730. For $70, this is not a horrible option, especially for a budget PC, HD PC, if you don't play very heavy games, 
uh, you don't play very often, or if you just don't mind lowering the graphic settings. Thank you for watching. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video, and if you're wondering what you want to watch next, go and check out my other my other channel, Brick Wall, where we up where me and my friends upload skits and other funny stuff. You should go watch Ball Slacks, the slacks for your sacks.